I'd like to welcome everyone um, to the webinar on Pool Investment Outlook, and we'll get rolling. So again, thanks to everyone for joining us today for a discussion about pool investments and outlooks in these uncertain times. My name is Stephanie Weiss, and I'm the Director of Education and Events, and I'm the sometimes tester of technology with our attendees for our webinars. In today's program, we're going to hear from Dan Smerick from Strategic Asset Alliance. Dan has more than 20 years of experience in his field, and he's the primary consultant for SAA's 23 governmental risk pooling clients who have invested assets of more than $5.5 billion. Today, Dan is going to share with us how pools of different types are dealing with the uncertain investment environment. He's also going to talk about where markets might be heading, and he'll help us understand impacts by using a blind peer analysis of the pooling client portfolios that he works with. Now, before we kick things off, I just want to share a few housekeeping and logistics details. You can adjust the webinar volume on your computer so it's at a level that's comfortable to you. If you're listening by phone and viewing the presentation online, we suggest that you turn off any nearby wireless devices. This will help your individual internet connection. If you have any sound issues, please try considering switching between phone and computer, excuse me, computer sound using the GoToMeeting controls. I mentioned earlier that all attendees are automatically on mute. So we ask that if you have a question, you type it in the question portion of the control panel. We'll answer your questions as we go if they are germane to the discussion at hand, or we'll hold them until the end and ask them at that point. And if there's just so many questions we can't get to all of them, we'll take your questions and share them with Dan as well as your email address so that that conversation continue in the background. And with that, I'm going to hand off this presentation to Dan and we'll see you guys in a little bit. Dan, go right ahead. Great, thank you. And hopefully you're uh, seeing a screen that says Risk Pool Investment Outlook, and I know Steph will tell me if you're not. And thanks everyone for taking the time today. Just what you need, another financial talking head, uh, but you have lots of different choices to make. So again, appreciate you taking the time today in this hour, and I have a, uh, where would an advisor be without slides? Uh, but we're going to cover a, a few things today from the session that Steph outlined. Uh, the market and COVID update, we all live uh, in interesting times, you know, and what a strange year it's been. Uh, as Steph mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about our risk pool clients and a blind peer analysis, give you some perspective about how they've performed, how they're allocated, the issues that are addressed uh, on an ongoing basis and, and routinely with the boards and committees with whom we work. And then more importantly is to leave you with some things to think about as we're back once again for low rates are uh, for longer. Uh, back in 08 and 09, a different set of circumstances, uh, but rates were low for a considerable period of time and still just starting to ratchet up in 18, only to do an about face again, uh, and then truly hit back to where we were with zero interest rate policies by the Fed on the heels of the COVID pandemic, which took its grip uh, back in March and April. Uh, so with that, uh, first one, you know, just a little tribute to the Grateful Dead here. Uh, I was listening to this the other day in the spirit of this. Uh, you just really can't make this up. And, you know, how do people adapt to uh, surprises? And so when we think about all the financial modeling out there that's done, whether it's by actuaries or, or asset managers or advisors, uh, quantitatively, we consider when markets go down, uh, we just don't know what's going to drive them. And if anybody would have been predicting a pandemic this year, uh, that was certainly on, on the uh, on the long odds side of things, uh, but still impacted the markets. So to give you an idea of how the markets were impacted, is looking at let's start with the fixed income market. You know, and of that 5.5 billion that Steph mentioned that that we advise on for pools, about 85% of that amount is in the bond markets. And so we'll start with that largest piece first. And so what you see here is a series of delightfully colored lines. Uh, again, with the legend on the right to give you an idea of what they are. And so they're tracked from year to date. So we go back, they're all coalesce as of the end of 12, December 31, 19, and then move forward based on how they've performed. As you can see, the markets were the bond markets, and I have four distinct ones, which really represent where the pools invest and where, frankly, the insurance market generally invests. Is the red is the most important? That is the aggregate bond market that represents all of the investment grade options that are out there to invest. Investment grade means anything that's rated AAA to triple B. Anything below that is high yield. 
and that's represented in blue. And as you can see, as we move from left to right, what happened in late February is the whispers of the COVID uh, pandemic started to come out of Wuhan, China, and then really manifest themselves in late March. You can see a couple things happen is that the purple line is the treasury market. The treasury's market started to reflect folks' appetite to stay away from risk. They wanted risk-free exposure. And as a result, those market values went up and the yields went down. At the same time, the red line and the green line representing the broad market and then the intermediate part of the market were also increasing with treasuries. But then as things started to take hold and people got concerned, we're looking, thinking about late April, early May, uh, the markets sharply reversed themselves. Uh, we started to see, as, as your investment managers would say, spread started to widen as people did not want to take risk. And you can see in the investment grade area, in the red and green, uh, things declined, but not nearly as rough as what happened in the high yield market is represented in blue. And you can see how dramatically that dropped, about 20% uh, from that shock. But of course, it's been coming back up since then. The important takeaway on this slide, if you look back to the long, strange trip it's been, if you look at where the 100 is on the right side of this exhibit here, that's where if we, if we started the year at 100, if we ended at 100, there'd be no change. You can see all of these markets have actually appreciated year to date through actually trading yesterday. So in your portfolios, you had some rough spots here, particularly if you had some high yield, but it's all come back on the heels of some of the euphoria, some of the vaccine news, et cetera, that we'll touch on later. If we look at the next slide, is let's talk about the equity markets. Uh, another uh, interesting aspect here, and this is broken out into four distinct lines that kind of give you some texture on how the equity markets have behaved. And I'm focusing on the US markets because that's where most of our clients' investments are. And you look at here, these four lines very lined up similarly to the previous slide, starting at the end of last year through yesterday. And they're organized by the type of investment to give an idea about, I'm sure you've all been reading about how technology has played a strong role in the recovery. And so this is exactly that. And layered on the top is green, is representing an ETF that is in the FANGS area. So those of you who don't know what FANGS are, you know, everybody's got to, finance people got to have acronyms, is you know, the old Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google uh, cadre. And so what's actually in that ETF is in the green box on the page here for you to look at at your leisure. But you can see all these equity markets going from left to right, all experienced similar drawdowns or similar declines, but you can see since the Fed and Congress provided the, sti the initial stimulus package, the equity markets have been recovering. But the green line most particularly is up 90% for the year through trading yesterday. So the pure tech market, 100% tech represented by this ETF is up almost 90% for the year. The red line is the NASDAQ 100. Another widely followed metric, but it's about 55% technology. That's up about 44% for the year through yesterday. The broader indices that you're all used to seeing from your advisors and the newspapers, et cetera, are, is the white one, and that is the S&P 500. And that's about 28% technology due to the appreciation of that sector, and that's up about 14% uh, through yesterday. But the real story is the rest of the market, however, is represented in blue, is the S&P uh, 500 without technology. And you can see as you go from left to right, that has had a much uh, much slower uh, recovery. And that's only up about 7%, but still up uh, for the year, but very different points of view, depending on where you're situated and how you're allocated across the equity markets. And this general profile would hold true internationally, but international hasn't performed as well as the US, particularly over the last two or three years, which we'll see in, in a few minutes. The biggest thing affecting all of us in the pooling business is yields are low, and it starts with the treasury market. And so what you see before you here are two uh, delightful lines. Uh, the dotted kind of a muted line on the top is showing you the treasury curve, the US governmental treasury curve as of the end of last year. And you can see going from left to right, shorter maturities are on the left as represented on the x-axis and the actual yield is on the vertical, is the one month and the three month yields on treasury bills were actually yielding one and a half percent or so. And you could move out to the 10 year note and it was getting close to 2%. Well, fast forward a few months, really into April even, and the credit and this curve completely dropped. So reinvestment yields are now extremely low. 
for those of you that held money in your money market funds or your sweep accounts at your custodians, uh, at the end of last year, we're actually saying, wow, I'm actually seeing one and a half percent on that money. Well, that's all going right back to zero again, if it already hasn't been. So you can imagine we've had lots of phone calls about how do we deal with our cash position that just eight or nine months ago is actually yielding uh, a reasonable amount, all things considered, when you compare to yields over the last decade. So this declining yields in the US Treasury market is gonna affect the next slide, which is gonna bl blind you with color, is all other fixed income instruments are priced off of the Treasury curve. And so what you see here is the corporate bond, the investment grade corporate curves. And so this is another large allocation that is present across a number of our clients. And just how to read this is showing you the colors here. So blue is investment grade rated A, uh, triple B is red. Then we go into below investment grade in purple, triple, uh, double B. That's the highest rating of below investment grade. And then we have yellow, which is single B. We don't go beyond that because things get uh, things get a little a technical or a little lumpier on that given the number of securities that are in triple C and below. But the takeaway here, besides looking at all these, these rainbow colors, is the exhibit down below here that's showing you the difference between each of these respective curves uh, relative to the end of last year and through trading yesterday. And so what you see here is looking at the blue and the red and the purple is showing you that the difference between the single A, triple B, and double B markets have declined in yield about 150 basis points on the shortest end of maturities. But as you start to move out and go out one year, two year, three year, four year, five years, you'll notice that the decline in yields is more acute in the investment grade area where most of you have investments. It's not as acute in the high yield markets, primarily because the credit exposure starts to outweigh some of the, uh, the, cl the claps in the US Treasury market yields. So one of the th initial foreshadowings here is that right now in SAA's view, high yield has a much better risk return profile in this kind of middle part of the maturity range than investment grade bonds do. And that's something, again, I'll come back to. But effectively, yields relative to treasuries, you can still make some money, but you have to consider the type of risk that you want to take. And what's highlighted here in the red dashed lines is just showing you a couple of thresholds. The first one is just at the 2% yield, and the next one is at the 3% yield, just to show you where these more bold curves, which are the most recent yield curves, on where they cross the lines to start making money in, uh, outside of what you can earn in treasuries. And this is going to drive returns going forward for a number of pools out there uh, if they can invest in some of these uh, securities as opposed to just treasuries and agencies. Well, we got to talk about COVID. So it affects us all. You know, we've got the metaphor here, the ripple in the pond. And the one thing, of course, I'm not going to inundate you with COVID statistics. You can see it all. Uh, we have the dubious distinction of having the most cases. Uh, you've seen the death rates, et cetera. Uh, but one, another angle is looking at it coming from the Committee of Responsible Federal Budget. Uh, I think that's kind of an oxymoron, depending no matter what public, uh, no matter what political party you stand in. But this is showing you based on them, tr them tracking all of the programs and the legislative and the, and the, uh, the, the monetary response, the monetary policy response is the amount of funds that have been dispersed or committed in solid. And then the, the shaded colors just within the bounds of the rectangle are showing you what's, uh, what's allowed. And so you can see, depending on the programs here, on there's still more dollars to be utilized in response to COVID. I think what's getting all of the press is the direct stimulus packages, particularly as a lot of these benefits run out. And for instance, the eviction protections start to run out, unfortunately, just right after Christmas time. Uh, so hopefully, I just say being hopeful, hopefully Congress will at least do something before they break. But also just, just to show you, and this is an interesting site to go to if you've never seen it, breaks it out in excruciating detail but it is a good way to track how the various legislative uh, actions that have been approved and how that money has actually been dispersed. And then you'd be surprised in some areas how little has actually been dispersed uh, outside, of, outside of the direct stimulus and the checks that were received earlier in the year. Uh, one big issue here, we think about employment. Over the last couple of weeks, uh, there have been a number of, of articles about people just leaving the workforce, discouraged workers, et cetera. And I think we're gonna to continue to see that, particularly if you're in sectors uh, that were most affected by COVID. You think of the leisure, the hospitality sector, uh, small business, we're in a small business depression, certainly here in Maine, uh, that has implications uh, in the short run. Will that change? Will there be a huge 
a resurgence uh, based on pent up demand after people come out of their shells, uh, depending uh, as the vaccine slowly starts to ramp up and get distributed around the world as we look out into 2021, particularly late 21, early 22. But the takeaway on this slide is looking at the period of time from left to right of the people who are on insured unemployment programs to just help make ends meet. And the blue line on this exhibit is showing you where we were in 08 and 09. And the gray shades on either end here represent recessionary economic periods. And at the peak of the 08 and 09 crisis, we had about seven and a half million people on some type of insured unemployment, typically through state programs. And that declined steadily over the decade until, you know, whoa, we have a mandated, whoop, we have a mandated healthcare shutdown that spikes unemployment and people on getting assistance up to 25 million. That has sharply come back as states, you know, open back up. And of course, we're going through potential shutdowns now. But the takeaway here is that in the middle of the page, as of the end of September, across these programs, for the state programs in particular, there's about 12 million that ties to the number on the right. But there's still also the continued pandemic aid, both initial and continuing, and some other state programs at that time. But the number is staggering. You think of 28 million people are getting some type of assistance just to keep things going. And that represents about 18% of the civilian workforce uh, defined by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But even more so, and as one of my clients reminded me, and maybe on the phone, uh, 28 million is uh, the population of the Lone Star State. So you think about Texas being completely reliant on some type of support helps put things in better perspective. Well, one of the things about this is how is this being handled? How is this being paid for? And what does this mean? And depending on your point of view, uh, how do you think about debt down the road for the next generation, et cetera? Well, one of the most quoted metrics uh, out there, particularly in the public press, is looking at our uh, federal debt outstanding divided by gross domestic product or GDP. And so if you look on the purple chart here, this rising curve here is just showing you going back to 1900 using the same statistic, the amount of outstanding federal debt this doesn't include unfunded pensions, et cetera, in states, just to depress everyone. This is just outstanding governmental debt. It's just showing you where this metric peaked uh, from 1900 to 1940 in World War II, declined all the way through, picked up in the 80s and 2000. You see the Great Recession. Uh, you see the pandemic. We're now at about 130% of federal debt to GDP. And of course, the rocket ship is showing you right now that's just projected to continue to go up. Uh, certainly for the next couple of years on the heels of the stimulus package that will undoubtedly be needed to uh, help just bolster uh, a good portion of the population that I mentioned on the previous slide. However, when we think about this metric, we're about 130% of federal debt to GDP. Japan's about 250 to give you some perspective there. So it, it, it has different meanings for different folks, but the one that I think is gonna drive the bus here for the next few years is how we can afford this. And in the middle of the page in the orange bars is showing you that even though this debt is increasing as a percent, as an absolute number and as a percentage of our gross domestic product or economic output, the actual cost of funding that debt is declining. Uh, and even though this is by the CBO, there are other metrics out there that are indicating the same type of thing, particularly on the heels of the Federal Reserve policy change uh, in, in April. But you can see here, so you have this 130% of our 130% debt to GDP. But if you look on this 2019 number, it was less than 1.8% of our GDP to finance that. And it's declining through 2023 based on the, based on the policy that the Fed has continued to broadcast uh, throughout, th throughout the next three or four years. So this is gonna allow both parties, in our, in our opinion, to continue to kick that can down the road and to afford pretty much whatever we need to do in order to uh, help folks reemerge uh, from the COVID-19 lockdowns and the economic issues and impacts that affect those folks. An interesting slide here, federal spending. You know, if you wanna look through the federal budget office, you have trouble sleeping, you can go pull that up online, but put in a nice info, uh, infographic here, it's just showing you the look at federal spending as of the end of 2019. Uh, fascinating site, uh, you know, the Peter J. Peterson Foundation, I've just recently found, but it's virtual capitalist is a very interesting site, uh, provides some exhibits like this that make it very easy to understand, lots of different flows, et cetera. But if you look at this slide, there are a couple takeaways I wanted to leave. One is we look on the left slide, uh, left side of the slide, left side of the exhibit is in red or the expenditures. 
And one important element here is the mandatory expenditures. That's the dark red. If you look at the $4.4 trillion of federal spending that was allocated in 19, 2.7 trillion of it was mandatory. And that's of course to the entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera. Uh, so those we can't really touch per se. Those are ongoing programs. The amount of discretionary federal expenditures is 1.3 trillion. And when you think about the fiscal stimulus that occurred at, in April, it effectively more, it, it, it provided, basically spent all that was spent in 2019 and more just on that issue. And so you put that together on the right and see, well, where does all this revenue come from? It comes from us, individual income taxes, payroll taxes, uh, corporations, for those of you on depending on what side of the aisle you're on, a very small amount that comes that way, uh, comes more through pay. Uh, but you can see that delightful dotted blue line here, right here, that's the deficit. And of course, that's something that ties to the previous slide. It's just not that big of an issue from a funding point of view right now. Uh, it will certainly become an issue later on again, but right now for what it needs to take, uh, this is something that is certainly manageable in our view as we look out over the next two or three years uh, to hopefully put this behind us. So what does that mean? So one thing is the grass greener and a little bit of humor here. My 75 year old mother likes to look at these slides I sent her, I don't, I don't know why, again, sleep aid, I don't know. But she asked me, she says, hey Dan, is that marijuana in the background? So I'm like, mom, what are you doing? So anyway, that's a slide aside. If we hop in here and talk about our client book, our portfolio, this is through our portfolios of our clients across a number of different pools. And there are a lot more dots than the 23 risk pool clients we have that Steph mentioned, because a number of them have legal, legally di differentiated trusts or pools. And so we just wanted to highlight here how people are invested as of the end of September of this year. And so on the vertical axes is a very important metric called book yield. And on the horizontal axes is a, a very important metric for sensitivity to the fixed income portfolio of duration. And the book yield number is very important because it indicates what is the earnings power of the portfolio that's going to throw, flow through your financial statements as a pool who has to file GASB and or mark to market. Uh, but this is the raw earnings power. So this does not include the changes in market value that flows through unrealized gain or loss. This is what are you earning in coupon? and appreciation, or excuse me, amortization or accretion of discount or premiums. And so as you'd expect on the, as you go from left to right, you see kind of a trend that the dots all kind of move up and to the right as you have higher duration or higher maturity in your portfolio, you tend to have higher yields. And to put it in contrast, the two geometric shapes you see here are the INT AG, that is the Intermediate Aggregate Bond Index. So it's the, entire investment grade bond market in the US minus the long-term bond. So it represents about 85% of the total bond market and frankly, where most of our most of the world invests. And then the ag, you can see that difference there, that additional 15% of securities that are not in the intermediate ag extend the maturity of the ag by almost another two years. And it gives you an idea about that disparity on who's issuing longer term debt corporations, the government starting to do it. But again, highlighting here, most of our clients are falling right now with yields, uh, even though they're low, because they have yields that they invested over the last couple of years and earlier. We have e book yields that are in the 2 to 3% range for most folks, and that's going to run off over the next few years. And that's, again, why we're talking about later on, what are some things you can think about to help reduce that decline in investment income that's built into your portfolios today? A lot of colors on this page is just highlighting how our clients are invested across the fixed income markets. You'll see a lot of variability here. A lot of this is dependent upon the restrictions in the respective states, the risk tolerance of the investment committees, as opposed to what's allowed, whether by regulation or allowed again by appetite. And so you'll see it runs the gamut, but I will say that the, the pools that have more exposure and latitude to invest in the light blue, which is corporates and taxable municipals primarily, or purple and asset-backed and commercial mortgage-backed securities, those are the pools that tend to have the higher yields and the higher earned income relative to the pools that are either unfortunately constrained just to invest in governments and agencies, or even worse, in our opinion, unfortunately, don't invest outside of that when perhaps they could. And I'll come back to that in an example in a few minutes to show you the dramatic impact of even just in today's environment, uh, what's potentially available. On the next slide is looking at credit rating. 
you know, this is important because it ties into, again, risk appetite. So we have sectors, how much credit risk we're taking. Green is AAA, the highest rating you can get. Uh, even though our U.S. government is rated AA plus by S&P and has been for now more than a decade. Uh, AA, and then really single A and triple B, that's primarily the corporate bond market. If we look at the corporate bond market now, it's almost entirely made up of single A and triple B securities. There's a handful of, uh, of double A's and there's three triple A's, I think. Uh, but some, some maker, but it's, it's, uh, it's Microsoft, Apple, and Johnson & Johnson. And if you look at that though, you can see the folks who have are dipping down into credit, back to my multicolored yield chart on saying, if you have some latitude to invest in single A and triple B corporates, they have much stronger earnings potential than their equivalent maturity treasury and agencies uh, or mortgage-backed securities. Well, let's see, let's talk about performance then. Well, great, Dan, how did they do over the last year? And so if we look at what's on this exhibit here, as just showing you over the last 12 months, ending September 30th of this year, here's how the various pools did using as a plotting metric, what's their total return on the, on the vertical axes, which is the combination of income received as well as appreciation or depreciation. In this case, it's appreciation given how dramatic yields fell during the year and then mapped out by duration. And of course, the longer the portfolio, the more sensitive it is to interest rate movement. And as interest rates declined, longer maturity portfolios saw much greater price appreciation. Well, now I'm gonna let the air out of, out of the sales here. So even though we have, we have folks here in the middle of this band, most of our clients, let's say, that are in the four to five, three to five duration band, we're up almost 6% on a trailing year basis ending September. When if we go back to the yield page, most of the yields our clients have are in the two to 3% range. So how did you get 6%? Again, showing you the tremendous drop in interest rates. So for those of you I'm seeing that, uh, that, uh, that we don't work with, you're gonna see this in your portfolios too, uh, six, seven, 8% returns on a year to date basis through, uh, through September. And that's continuing on into, you know, a little bit into October and November, it's come down a little bit. But these are not going to continue, folks. These are going to start to naturally decline just on how bond math works. Uh, the only way we'd see these again, in our view, is if we saw negative yields. We certainly don't want to see negative yields in our view. Europe did it. It's a failed experiment, in our opinion. Uh, that would create even more pressure on, on earnings. Fortunately, the Federal Reserve, even I think with the change of the guard and with uh, incoming with Janet Yellen, that's not something the Fed wants to experiment with. And I hope they continue uh, with that rhetoric. So the one year has been most pronounced because of the shock in interest rate and the policy change dramatically in April. And if you look at how it affects the three-year numbers, you'll see you got the same kind of line here, but you'll notice that the return kind of in the middle, it's not 6% anymore, it's about four and a half. So that one year shock, it's, it, it affects looking in that period, but if we go back in time, these are gonna come back more towards what's your embedded yield. And why that's important is yield in your portfolio, your fixed income portfolio represents about 95% of what your total return is going to be. So if you have a 2.5% portfolio in your book yield and you see a year like we had last year and you're up 6%, well, you're going to see some negative returns at some point down the road that's going to get you back at the end of the day to that 2.5%. And that's what we're talking about and we're thinking about what can we do to perhaps stem that decline uh, in performance as, as interest rates remain low. And one thing that all managers, you know, if there's any, any other folks or competitors or managers on the phone, uh, they, they hate to see this slide, and this is fixed income fees. And so what you see is this is the fee base across all of SAA's clients for core fixed income management. And you'll see the median and the average are pretty much on top of each other. It's about 11 basis points per annum. And when you start to go below that number, a lot of those mandates that are down there are, are are constrained mandates. They can invest in treasuries and agencies, maybe a little bit of corporates, et cetera. And those managers have different fee schedules because they can't take advantage of the full spectrum of what's available in the investment grade bond market. Meanwhile, those above it, you can see, um, have typically full availability across the investment grade markets. And some have also investment accounting and some other services built into them. But I'd say it just continues, if you're looking at this and depending on the size of your pool, one takeaway is the size of the portfolio is represented on the horizontal axes. And you'll notice that there isn't much of a decline 
or slope of increasing prices per se based on your size. So fee compression continues to surprise us at SAA and it has the last decade or more uh, as folks look at the yield environment and determine how are they gonna price their product uh, for risk pools and other types of clients. And so this is something certainly beneficial for you all uh, because low fees, you have, to, you, know, you have to pay your expert something, but these types of fees, lower fees for the value just translates right down to your bottom line with additional earned income based on your fee level. Well, let's talk about the next part of the portfolio or that 15% uh, that we mentioned the SAA client that's invested in risk assets. And so when we say risk assets, it's anything that's not high quality investment grade fixed income. So this could be high yield, it's gonna be US equities, it's gonna be international equities, primarily across our client base. Uh, what you see here is a metric you're used to seeing is the percentage of risk assets uh, of your, as part of the total portfolio, much like your own personal portfolio. Do you have 60% bonds and 40% stocks? A lot, in the, a lot in the press about that lately, how that's maybe gone to roost, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but this is a metric to look at. You can see our client base typically runs in the 10 to 11% range as a percentage of the total portfolio. Those folks you see all the way to the right, uh, that say PNC, property and casualty, sorry to make this clear earlier, health, health, health providers, health trust, or RE is reinsurers. Uh, these are folks that are constrained. Uh, nearly all of them except two are completely constrained and cannot invest in risk assets. The other two elect not to at this time, although, although I'm working on them. Well, the more important metric that we look at when we think about risk assets is that same dollar amount, but as a percentage of your surplus or net position. And that's so very important because you use your surplus to do so many other things, your reserves, your underwriting, uh, risk management programs, wellness programs, all the other things uh, to support your members and provide availab availability and stability of rate. And if you look at this basis going from left to right, our highest allocation across our client base of risk assets to surplus is pushing 60%, but the mean and average range about 20 to 23%. Our typical target for folks when we talk about who want to go into risk assets is you got to make it material. So we typically look at 25% of surplus as a starting point to determine how risk assets can be blended into a portfolio strategy to help enhance returns longer term. And in the case of the low yield environment today, actually increase investment income uh, in this environment. If we look at how these folks are invested, going from left to right primarily you see in the light blue we're in a sea of blue uh, that's u.s equities uh, if i think about my experience across the pools a lot of it is when you go in and educate folks on asset classes it's what they know themselves what are they most comfortable with in their own personal views personal lives and investing and u.s equities is certainly at the top of that list then you can move in international equities because equities but yeah they're international but there's a lot of international companies particularly big ones that have u.s revenue that gets a little murky where you get into, I think, a little more on the educational front is you look into the green, which is high yield bonds. And in this case, purple is another asset class within high yield, primarily bank loans, a different type of high yield instrument. I'm gonna come back to that. But as you can see, you go from left to right. We have some folks that are all US equity. We have one a PNC company because of some allocation changes recently is all high yield. But generally speaking, as you move out, uh, you can see a number of these folks have diversified away from just US equities and thinking about not only diversifying, but also enhancing the income element of their risk asset allocation. Dan, I'd like yes. to pop in with a question that we have Please. from one of the attendees. The question is with interest rates at historical lows and equities at all time highs, which have resulted in big unrealized gains for a lot of pool portfolios, how would you answer the question, shouldn't we sell these investments and claim the gains? Sure. Well, thank you for that. I've had a number of those questions recently. And the fact that there are a couple of different answers. You know, one is if you realize gains, uh, where are you going to put the reinvestment proceeds? So it's going to appear in your financial statements as a realized gain, but then what are we going to do with the proceeds? And depending on the argument, uh, you know, if you look at how equity markets are priced and hearing that they're priced high today using price to uh, price to earnings ratios. Uh, there are some issues with price to earnings ratios in our view that you could argue that the equity markets aren't necessarily undervalued, particularly given how low investment yields are in other asset classes that we're going to see, in our view, we're going to see more dollars chasing the equity market 
as we look out into 2021 is our view. That doesn't mean we're ramping up the equity allocations for our clients. But one of the things uh, to specifically answer your question with the run up in equities is we're certainly very mindful of rebalancing. Uh, the investment policy statement and the strategic asset allocation across our clients is extremely important because it helps guide us when humans naturally get a little emotional uh, in run-ups or run-downs in particular. And so I would say that to that question, when we have these gains, if they're falling outside of the targets and beyond a, a comfortable uh, tolerance range we have, we are absolutely rebalancing and taking those gains and redeploying them. But we're considering redeploying them in a different way outside of investment grade bonds. And I'm gonna to touch on some of those uh, different spots in a couple of minutes. I appreciate the question. So let's talk about risk assets, uh, how we did last year. And so this chart's a, a, a little interesting in the sense on the vertical axes is this total return on how the risk asset portfolios did. But the horizontal axes is a range to say, well, how much of our clients' portfolios were invested risk assets in just US equities? And so what you see all the way to the top right is you see we have a couple of clients that are only invested in U.S. equities. Uh, that was really the place to be the last year, as opposed to being in other asset classes. And you see two reference, four reference points here. The S&P was the best place to be for the trailing 12 months ending in September. Uh, the world, uh, the world equity index uh, minus the U.S. was number two. Barclays, the high yield market number, uh, number three, and then the developed uh, EFA index uh, was the worst. And so when you look at where a lot of our clients are, they had a diversified portfolio over the last year and had to endure what happened on the equity markets in particular uh, through September. And you can see most of them are falling in this two to 4% range on a trailing basis. It was kind of an ugly trailing year uh, for equities, uh, but we were still earning income during that period of time, again, which I'll come back to. So you look at the last three years, same type of thing. Most of these portfolios in the middle that are blended to deal with U.S. equities, a little international high yield, are generating between four, six, seven percent returns. Again, with more income bias, uh, more income bias in the portfolio. Uh, the one thing that has happened with risk assets is when we think about risk assets longer term, is we look at risk assets over a trailing three, five year horizon, is to outperform fixed income by three to five hundred basis points or buy a premium of three to 500 basis points. That's what we're looking for. And of course, that was pretty much wiped out with what's happened in the markets in the earlier part of the year. But as you've seen, the markets come roaring back, particularly in November, uh, making some of these numbers are gonna be uplifting even more uh, through the end of the year. Uh, the other metric here when we think about this, it, coming back to uh, how we're invested overall is the invested assets to surplus. And this takes into account everything. So how big is my investment program relative to the total portfolio, uh, so relative to my surplus? And so the larger this metric is on this exhibit going from left to right, the much more sensitive your portfolio is to any change in the investment markets. So we have a couple of uh, highly levered uh, uh, pools that we work with that have almost 500% invested assets to surplus. And even though they have a smaller allocation of risk assets to surplus, their fixed income portfolio just the volatility in a high quality fixed income portfolio can have uh, major swings in their surplus value. And this is all part of the, you know, the allocation process on how, what their lines of business are, what they're writing, they happen to be a couple of reinsurers. But generally speaking, when we look across our client book here, most folks fall in this uh, one and a half, that's 150 to 200% invested assets to surplus compared to some commercial carriers, which are gonna be, can be three, four, 500%. So pools naturally are more conservative than our other commercial clients that we have. Well, let's really tie in, well, what can we do? You know, in SAA's view, some thoughts here. Yields are gonna be lower for longer in our view. It brings us back to 08 and 09. Uh, some of the things kind of dusting off some of the things there and also raising some, some new items to think about. Uh, but I'd like to start with the one thing about returns and thinking about asset classes and, the, and I appreciate again the question of equity markets being potentially overvalued depending on how you look at it, what you think about it. But one of the things I always keep in mind is what's our horizon? And so on this exhibit is a slide that for folks we work with have seen on a number of our quarterly reports and we walk with walk through with boards is when you look at the stock market and the bond market or a 50-50 blend, and this goes back from uh, basically post-World War II through the end of 19, and you break these, these periods into trailing one-year returns, if you look all the way to the left, 
you'll see that things can be extremely volatile in the equity market with a high of up 47% and a low of minus 39%, uh, actually attributed to 08 and 09. You can see when you start to diversify, you start to reduce the drawdown, as we call it, or that downside volatility. But interestingly enough, as you move out through time and you take the same amount of data, but you do rolling five-year periods, rolling 10-year periods, rolling 20-year periods, a lot of these rolling year periods for this thinking in the pools time frame are much longer than the individuals working or running the pool. So when we think about the going concern element, you can actually potentially stomach a little more risk in the portfolio when you think about it from a horizon point of view. But you have to be able to tolerate these short-term swings in markets for your financial statements to achieve these longer-term benefits that you see in rolling 10-year and rolling 20-year periods when you move into riskier asset classes, in this example being stocks. Well, to put some perspective, the last 10 years on how we're invested is if you look, this is showing you the risk and return, a very common way to project these things of return on the vertical axes and the standard deviation or the volatility of those returns over the last decade ending November. The crosshairs to make this a little easier to read is the S&P 500. And we have cash all the way down here on the bottom. That's even lower now. And as you move up and to the right, you can see, tying back to my point about yields, the aggregate bond has lots of govies in it, governments and agencies, high yield bank loans, corporate fixed income, high yield. They all start to earn more because they have a higher embedded yield element to them, but they are a little more volatile than just the aggregate bond market. Then you move into equities, kind of a lost decade for the international world in both an absolute and a currency basis. And being in the S&P 500 or the larger stocks has certainly been more advantageous than being in mid cap and smaller stocks. But still, it follows the general trajectory for most of the clients that we have, just as a matter of a matter of fact, that the more you moved into these asset classes over the last 10 years, the higher your returns were, and you had some higher volatility. But when you put them all together, you actually helped reduce volatility in the overall portfolio relative to just having it invested in the aggregate bond. So what do you do? The quest for fixed income. And we think about what can you do? What can your advisor do? What can your manager do? You really got five major switches when we think about that 85% of SAA's you know, risk pool clients and bonds. You can tinker with duration or the maturity of the portfolio. You can tinker with credit quality, high yield. You can tinker with liquidity. Uh, you can tinker with structure like commercial mortgage-backed securities and other structured instruments in the mortgage market, asset-backed securities. Or you can deal with leverage. You can actually take all of these and add an element of debt to them to enhance returns. That kind of works both ways. I'm going to stick with the, the top four here in this exhibit. And let's look at yields. Hey, a lot of numbers on this page. Wanted to just highlight all the way to the right, just showing you how dramatic yields have fallen for the year. You can see all the down arrows. A lot of these have fallen more than 100 basis points. And other, another takeaway here is in the middle of the page, the difference between the U.S. aggregate and the global aggregate bond at the end of the year, the U.S. was out earning the global market by about 100 basis points. That's declined to about 29 basis points now to show you the convergence of overall global monetary policy in light of the COVID pandemic. If we look here, kind of starting thinking about income and volatility, this is looking at three uh, widely used asset classes for fixed income. We have the 10-year treasury in red, solid red is income only. We have investment grade corporate bonds in green, uh, solid green is income only, and blue is high yield income only. And what you'll notice is how steady those lines are as you go from left to right, going back the last, this goes back to 1996, uh, you start, you, sorry, 1990. And you can see that as you stack and you go above treasuries, you earn more income. Back to my point, you're gonna out earn treasuries, which means you're gonna out earn that market under any number of circumstances over a longer horizon and high yields even more so. The one thing you'll notice is the dotted lines represent the total return or the swings in market value associated with these three different market sectors. But you'll notice that the red and the green aren't so different from one another as far as how high or low those go. And then high yield has certainly more pronounced, but just showing you it's not as volatile as I think feedback I get from our boards that I've talked to or done education sessions on, when you think about high yield in the long term, given how much they out earn core fixed income, especially in today's environment. 
Reinvestment yields for an intermediate bonds are less than 1%. You can buy high yield for 45 to 5%. A real live example for a pool uh, asked me, they unfortunately, they've only been able to invest in governments and mortgages. They're trying to go back to their legislature to see about, can we even get corporates in the portfolio? And showing you examples of $50 million portfolio. They were only governments. This was their actual returns going back a decade. Well, what if we added 25% corpse and 40% investment grade corpse? Investment grade, no high yield. And granted, hindsight, everyone's a genius. But if you look at what the difference is, I want to go to the green arrows. By just having 25% of the portfolio in high quality corporate bonds, they were going to earn an additional 200,000 in the last year. But over the last 10 years, they would have earned an additional two and a half million or $250,000 a year. If you would have gone to 40% corpse, which is more aligned with the allocation across our clients that have corporates, you're going to earn an additional $4 million. When you think about that and how that's distributed to your members in the form of rate stability uh, and programs, uh, that's real money. And at the bottom here is the red line just showing you that the volatility of the overall portfolio declined. So not only did you earn more money, you also saw lower volatility, i.e. the only free lunch in investing, in our view, is diversification. And so that is alive and well here and a very uh, a representative example uh, for folks who are constrained moving into other portfolios. If you added high yield, this would be even more pronounced. So let's talk about high yield quickly. So we have the investment grade bond market, $6.7 trillion at the end of September. Floating, re floating rate loans is a, a section of the high yield market, 1.2 trillion. And then the high yield bond market of 1.4 trillion. Um, as an aside, as a fun fact, the uh, Amazon's market cap is about the same size as the US floating rate bond market, 1.2 trillion. Uh, give you an idea what's going on in tech as opposed to the bond market. Uh, these are two areas where our clients have been. What we like about floating rate bank loans, as an example, is showing you the yield on these instruments versus the duration. Most of our clients here, you look at where the aggregate is today, municipal bonds, you know where folks uh, are investing if that's their benchmark. High yield and floating rate bank loans tend to be shorter, much, uh, shorter durations. High yields are actual bonds, but floating rate bonds are a different animal. They're floating rate instruments that have almost no duration exposure. Uh, it's pretty much a credit instrument only. And given the time, we don't have time to get into that, but leaving you with that, a very different type of, of profile when you think about high yield and being able to pick up yield in a low environment that's still yielding anywhere from four to 5% currently. Private credit is another one. Uh, private credit is, there are different classifications of corporates. You have publicly traded corporates. Those are fully registered. You have a, a, a type of private called 144A corporates that are issued only to qualified institutional buyers uh, north of invested assets of 100 million. Then you have pure privates. These are placed directly with the investors. This happens to be from a firm that we've, uh, we've worked with in the past and do not currently. Uh, securing asset management is just showing you going back to their purchases, going back to 08, uh, to, to the uh, September of 2020. Investing in private credits as opposed to public credits. Here's how much additional spread they earned relative to the public market. When you see that, 42, uh, 42 basis points in 08, current environment 19 and 20, 67 basis points, 92 basis points. You know, that's real money depending on the flexibility you may have. That's one area to consider for I'd say some of the larger pools to think about pure privates, whether it's specific or whether it's driven by funds. Uh, let's get into private equity. I get a lot of questions on private equity. Uh, an interesting example here is just showing you the biggest 25 firms. This is through the end of 2019. How much was raised in the middle dot here, the bullseye over the last five years? About $800 billion was raised by the top 25 private equity firms, almost all of them in the United States. Uh, $800 billion, to give you some perspective, that's about 2% of the U.S. equity market cap as of today. So private equity, although it's, it is big, it's not as big as the market, but one of the issues is, is the opportunities that private equity, where are they going to put their money as opposed to publicly traded uh, organizations? Uh, you, you get a kind of a feeling some days that these folks get to kind of pick the good uh, ventures on which they invest. Uh, so I won't spend much time here. I think it's something worth looking at. I've been asked, can we? what about private equity? Typically, when you get into pools, uh, there's lockup periods. There's other things to consider. But down the road, this is certainly something thinking 
on the horizon comment I made over a much longer term. Uh, that is something certainly that I think some of the larger pools, uh, the well-capitalized pools certainly have some capacity for, particularly if interest rates continue to stay so low. But the real highlight of this slide, folks, is down in the bottom right, Apollo, a well-known private equity firm, is they saved the Twinkie a couple of years ago, a few years ago, when Hostess Brands went bankrupt, Apollo stepped in. You know, so that's the fun fact of the day on this slide. If we go to the next slide, Bitcoin, I've been asked like this yesterday, you know Bitcoin is a little frothy. I had a uh, call from uh, not one, but I've had two, uh, two folks uh, that run pools call me and ask about Bitcoin. Uh, they're doing it on their own personal front. Uh, I'm happy to talk about that with our folks, but you can see one thing about this slide that's interesting, going back to 2017, when you saw that big spike was all over the paper, is the Bitcoin price happened to be very much aligned with how many people were searching for it on Google. That's not the same right now. As you look from that, since the end of 2017, the price of Bitcoin has been going up, particularly this year, as kind of a safe haven. I don't know how you define safe haven in that category, but certainly more institutional players are getting into Bitcoin. Uh, I'll save that for another day. I thought it was just a fun fact, but this is certainly something uh, that's going you're gonna see more traction, the whole cryptocurrency thing in the paper. Uh, whether it's legit or not, um, the jury's still out uh, in, in our opinion. So let's look at another thing that's gonna affect you all. It's coming for you is uh, ESG, environmental, social, and governance for you. Uh, I've shown this slide to a number of our clients. You have the E is a lot easier to get your hands around. You know, if you don't want coal, you don't invest in coal. You don't want oil, you don't invest in oil. Uh, you got other things here, water scarcity, et cetera. A lot of different things mean things to different folks and the importance. And you move to the other two, social and governance, they also tend to be a highly technical term, squishier, uh, depending on what the values, the perspectives are of the underlying pools. But all of these are certainly playing a much larger role in how companies are being viewed, how fixed income managers are reviewing credits, uh, not only as part of their normal credit process, but how the ES&G focus is now helping them or uh, hindering is the wrong word, but helping them reevaluate how they're looking at credits in light of the ESG. This is just coming for you. Uh, so I, we certainly would rather be more active about it with our clients than reactive as this continues to gain traction. Well, how much traction uh, do we have here? It's showing you from a, a biannual study done by the Global Sustainability Investment Review here. In 16, $22 trillion of sustainable investing was in place with this, uh, with this analysis at 16. 18, it's up to 30 trillion. Uh, the 20 figures come out in early 21. This number is going to be north of 40, probably closer to 50 in our view, just showing you again, $50 trillion. Uh, again, that eclipses our equity market cap in the US by about 20 trillion. Uh, that's a kind of an estimate showing this is continuing to exponentially grow in importance and certainly being driven by demographics, primarily the millennials at this time. So some additional final food for thought in the few minutes we have left here is the other thing to think about is what's so different. Um, and I use this and was, again, I always appreciate Agrip's uh, opportunity to come and, and speak is how things have just changed from speed on how we all have to process information, how our kids and grandkids are being exposed to information and how they basically their brains rewire for this. And three uh, amazing statistics, you know, since the pre-modern times, the speed of human movement has increased by a factor of a hundred. That in itself is miraculous when you think about that. Uh, the speed of communications, when we think about uh, just natural data flows, uh, the speed of, of, you know, from telephones, et cetera, now to the internet has increased by a factor of 10 million. But if you look at the overall speed of how data transmission has gone, and this continues to escalate, it's by a factor of 10 billion. So you think about that and how data flows, not just financial data, but how informational data, uh, informational data flows uh, around the world for decision making or uh, misinformation, disinformation, or real information. Uh, it's certainly a lot to take in on how this affects the markets. Uh, so just again, some, some things to think about as we look ahead, particularly as artificial intelligence continues to uh, gain its uh, foothold in some of the processes that affect uh, uh, the risk pool, uh, risk pool product, whether it's underwriting or claims, uh, investing, we're talking to managers about how they're embedding AI in their systems. All these types of things, just something to keep your uh, your eyes and ears on as we look into 21 and, and beyond. Uh, the other thing about everything I talked about today, and again, appreciate you you're taking some time out of your day, is investments in our view with our background, it's always supports what you're trying to do at the enterprise. And so just a very simple grid, you have surplus or net position in the middle, 
What I talked about today, the investment risk here in the bottom right is just one of the quadrants of the major elements that you all have to deal with in supporting your members through underwriting, the types of products you offer, the type of coverages you offer, to reinsurance and reserving. We know what's going on in property, property reinsurance. Uh, the reinsurers are tightening up. Uh, operational risk, your people that go home every night. Uh, what are you trying to do on that front? Disaster recovery, COVID plans, how remarkably seamless it was uh, to have calls like this today across multi-generational boards. I'm still surprised at how easily they took to it, although they had to be forced to it with COVID is my only caveat. And so throughout the day, all the types of ideas, I, some high level ideas I left you with, again, thinking about high yield a different way, thinking about perhaps equities a different way, thinking longer term, thinking about private credit, just a couple of the things to think about that may actually have a better risk reward profile than the investment grade bond market. And so when a board member says to you, well, it's really safe, uh, we're, we're gonna be comfortable, we're in high quality investments, well, that's true in one regard, but if I can earn a much higher rate over a longer period of time with volatility I can stand, isn't that the less riskier way to go as we think about it? And so with that, I would just really appreciate your time today and, uh, and thank you. I'll turn it back to Steph if there are any other questions. Thank you, Dan. We do have another question that came in. And it's in relation to the presentation you did with us in Orlando, as a matter of fact, which seems almost decades ago. So it was yeah. only, what, March, maybe nine months yeah. ago? Um, the, the attendee asks um, and pointed out, you brought up um, machine learning. And in March, you talked a little bit about some of the challenges of machine learning, things related to data, data management, um, potential surprises, a winner takes all environment as well as lack of transparency. And they're wondering what sorts of changes you've seen in the last nine months around any of those challenges and where things have started to move toward, or if it's just not far enough along yet. Yeah, I appreciate the question. You know, I keep my, cause I'm personally interested in that and how I think about AI. I mean, it's continuing to uh, move along in the investment world, particularly in the larger firms that have, you know, vast amounts of capital and resources to deploy. But I'd say one area where it's being most deployed is you know, the disclosed information, financial information, the publicly available information. You know, that's easy to get. How it gets collated and synthesized is, you know, I say fairly straightforward for you know, the folks who deal with that every day. It's the unstructured data that I think where artificial intelligence, if that's gonna, it's, they're trying to yield fruit there for all the other types of data that's not relevant to a public disclosure by a company or even a private investment depending on what sector they're in, what they do, how they're gathering information, whether it be from satellites, uh, you know, where they sit, you know, pollution issues, demographics from where they are, how do they factor all those in to find or discern patterns that no matter how seasoned an analyst is, they're not gonna, they're not gonna view. So if you look at all the major sites or you, look at, you know, even look at Google AI and you go out and get a sense, AI is being experimented with more, that's ramping up and you can see and get a sense for that when you look at some of the exchange traded funds that focus on innovative technology, uh, look up, type that in Google and take a look at some of those. You're gonna see some AI ETFs that will point you in some very interesting directions about what some of these AI firms are doing with respect to what I you know, just briefly touched on in my cursory view uh, last March and get in as much detail as you want depending on what your sector interest is. Wonderful. Well, Dan, we don't have any additional questions. So I think with that, um, we should say thank you to our attendees for taking time from their day to join us. And of course, thank you to you for joining us and always being such a strong supporter of our pooling community. Thank you so much for your time today, Dan. You're welcome. And to our attendees, have a lovely remainder of your day.